read a little bit and talk a little bit as we go through some of the stories of our readings for this week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for inviting us into a journey, inviting us into an experience, a relationship, and not just giving us a password to use when we die. Lord, help us to invite the fullness of your kingdom to transform us and to work through us to be a blessing to those you've put in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the big things that Jesus came to do was to teach people to think differently, to see differently. Because they've gotten very good at thinking and seeing things through religious lenses. And at least when I was a kid, the point of religion was to get the desired result. And that was to go to heaven. So for me, that was the whole reason you went to church. Not somebody else said that was the only reason. But the only reason was, if I just do the right things, then I'll get to go to heaven. But there wasn't any sense that my faith had something to do with the relationship with God now. It was just a destination. But the kingdom of God, Jesus needed to teach people to see things differently. Because religion is about human activity that we do with God at a distance. But the kingdom of God is God's presence that changes what we do and how we live. So Jesus is teaching them not so much about a destination, which religion would have them gain, but he was teaching them about a participation in a relationship. And of course the destination is there, it's not like the kingdom gets rid of the destination. It just adds on the fact that, that eternal life begins now, as Jesus would teach his disciples. We get tastes of it now as we experience God's kingdom breaking in. And of course the day will come when we will be with God, we'll see God face to face, experience it fully. But Jesus is inviting them to participate in the kingdom now. And he's going to invite, it's not going to be very long after he invites his disciples to follow, before he's going to be sending them out to do the same things that he's doing. They don't even have everything figured out, but yet he says, now you go out, you proclaim the kingdom, you go out, you demonstrate your kingdom. And the amazing thing is, that's exactly what they did. He sent them out to the villages that he was about to go to, and they proclaimed the kingdom of God, and what they discovered was, is that they proclaimed the kingdom of God, that God is near, they saw God do things. They saw God heal people. They saw demons cast out. And they're thinking, hey, this is weird. The same things are happening through us that happened through Jesus. And as they go back, they're excited. They're excited about all the amazing things that they experienced. But Jesus, when he comes back, he's excited for what happens. But it's interesting how he refocuses them. He says, yes, the stuff that happens is really exciting. But don't get so focused on the stuff that happens that you forget about your connection with God. So he says, rejoice that these things happen, but more important, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Because as long as you stay connected to God, you'll discover that these things will happen. But if you focus on the things, you might end up forgetting about the relationship. 
So, as the disciples have gone out and proclaimed and demonstrated the kingdom, as Jesus has been proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom, it's been drawing a crowd. And when people get excited, you don't always plan ahead well. You don't think about, well, I wonder if we're here tonight, if we're going to have enough food or a place to stay. You just get excited about following what's going on. And that's the case. They have a crowd of people that are in a situation now in the wilderness, and there's not necessarily going to be enough food or a place to stay. And the disciples realize that, and they say to Jesus, for the sake of the people, let's just send them away. They can get some food. They can get a place to stay. But what does Jesus say? He says, you know what? I've been teaching you something about the kingdom. What happened when you went out with what you thought wasn't, weren't enough resources? You had what you needed. You saw God's power work through you. We're going to do another lesson on the kingdom. We don't need to send these people away. You might not think there's enough resources, but I'm going to teach you something more about putting the resources you have into the hands of God and see Him provide. So, once again, Jesus isn't just teaching them to watch Him. He's actually going to invite them to participate in the miracle. They're going to be the ones with their own hands distributing the food and seeing what God does. So at the end of this whole thing, Jesus is going to be asking, okay, have you figured out who I am yet? Because as I've been talking about, the whole point that Jesus has is not to keep them dependent upon him, but to equip them to go and do what he's been doing, because he's going to be going away. So he's at a place now where he's going to be getting ready to head south to Jerusalem for the last time, where he's going to be arrested, where he's going to be crucified. And he needs to know that his team is going to be ready to take over as the ones representing him in the world. So he takes them away in, out of Jewish territory into Gentile territory to Caesarea Philippi. He has a retreat with them, and he's just asking, okay, we're headed someplace. He doesn't tell them right away. But have you figured out who I am yet? And Peter comes up with the right answer. He says, well, um, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's the right answer, because all Isaiah 35, various Old Testament um, prophecies describe what it would look like when the Messiah came, when the kingdom of God broke in. The blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would walk, um, food provision would come from heaven, miracles over nature. And Jesus is one by one doing all of those things that were supposed to happen when the Messiah came. They have the right answer, but there's a danger once again. Because what do they think if they come up with that answer that Jesus is the Messiah? They think it's going to be gravy from that point on. They think it's, okay, good. Now we can just relax. Everyone will come and serve us. We'll be wealthy. We'll be popular. Life will be easy. And Jesus needs to calm them down a little bit and say, okay, you've got the right answer of who I am, but I need to be doing some teaching about what my kingdom looks like. What you're going to discover is that you're not going to have an easy life by following me. Your life might actually be pretty challenging but your life is going to be more fulfilling and worthwhile than you could ever imagine as you learn how to take up the cross and follow, as you learn that as you give your life away that you'll find life, as you learn that greatness in the kingdom is not being served, but greatness in the kingdom is getting on your knees and washing feet and serving other people. So he's going to be teaching them all the way from Caesarea Philippi down to the night of the Lord's Supper what power and greatness in his kingdom look like. Our second reading is Matthew chapter 14. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter came out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So Jesus is going to be doing different times where he's not going to be with them. He's going to be sending them off to practice doing things on their own. He had done that earlier when he sent them out two by two to the villages. And now this is after John the Baptist has been killed. 
Jesus says, I just need some time to get away from myself and pray. And once again, he sends them off to the next mission site by themselves. And as they go out, when, it, when you're following God's call on your life and headed where he's leading you to go, it's always going to be easy with no challenges, right? <laughs> no, it's not. And actually, that's what the disciples discover. He's sending them to their next place of mission, and what, what happens on the sea? A storm comes up. And did Jesus just leave them to deal with the storm by themselves? No. Even though he had sent them out to learn how to minister on their own, he would meet them in the midst of the storm. And the thing that's interesting to me that got my attention as I was reading and thinking about how Jesus is inviting them not just to observe him, but to do what he's doing, I think Peter is starting to get the idea. Peter's thinking, you know what, Jesus has been having us not just watch him, but Jesus has been having him do the things that he's doing. So I wonder if Peter's thinking that when he says, Jesus, why don't you, have, can I come out to the water on you, or up to where you are? And Jesus says, yeah, hey, come on, you're getting the point. Uh, let me show you about what it means to trust the kingdom of God. And of course, when Peter starts to see the waves in the water, he ends up sinking. But in many ways, I think he's got the right idea. Jesus, if I'm going to represent you, I'm not just going to teach what you teach, but I'm going to be able to experience the kingdom in ways that you experience the kingdom. Just the thought that came to my mind as, we were, as I was reading this time. Um, but what happens? He meets them in the midst of the storm, and as he meets them in the midst of the storm, it says, when he got in the boat, what happened to the storm? The storm was calm. Now once again, it was the list of all those things in the Old Testament that would happen when the Messiah came. That when the Messiah comes, that he's going to end up not just healing people, but he's going to end up displaying power over nature. And so now the question once again, who is this? This must be the Son of God. Our third reading is from John chapter 9. There we go. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the man on the mud, mud on the man's eyes saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed, and came back able to see. So for the second time, the Pharisees called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, and as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We started to see once again the difference between looking through religious eyes and the eyes of the kingdom. The religion seeks to explain reality. It seeks to explain why this person doesn't belong and why this person does belong. It seeks to explain why this person's suffering and why this person's not suffering. And back in Jesus' day, they had some very clear understandings. That this man, obviously, if he was born blind, either somehow he sinned while he was in the womb or his parents sinned, it's obvious. And when, when he's blind because of sin, then that must be what God wants. So if God wanted him blind because of sin, do you even, are, you, are you really even supposed to pray for him? Are you supposed to ask God to heal him if, if God made him blind in the first place because of his sin? And so Jesus is saying that's not a real helpful way of looking at the world. The whole point is that as God's kingdom breaks in, we're not trying to justify why he's blind. As God's kingdom breaks in, we're trying to bring healing, we're trying to bring hope, we're trying to bring a new beginning, so that God's
presence and God's power changes things rather than just religion trying to explain why they're happening the way they're happening. So, we continue with the next reading. I could go longer, but you don't want me to. <laughs> Our next reading is from Mark chapter 5. And Jesus and his disciples will encounter a severely demonized man in the land of Gerasenes. His healing will not bring joy, but will cause the people of that area to tell him to leave. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim to the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. I realized there was something else I wanted to say about the last one. And that was, in that point of Jesus' journeys, um, as he's heading from that meeting where he's asked, do you know who I am? Um, a blind man is healed, and then later on the blind man is also healed. And there's this understanding that a lot of what's happening is trying to figure out now who actually is starting to see through eyes of the kingdom, and who's not seeing through eyes of the kingdom, they're still seeing through religious eyes. And so by the end of the story, it's the one who had been blind from birth, who was given up as a sinner, is the one that sees the kingdom. And the religious people, who at the end of the story, end up just really displaying that they're the ones that are blind. Jesus is going to say something similar where he says to the religious leaders, um, the prostitutes and the tax collectors are entering the kingdom of heaven above, ahead of you. Because they're actually learning to see what the kingdom of heaven is like. But instead, here I am the Messiah right in front of you and you don't even recognize me. So there's that invitation to not see through eyes of religion but through eyes of the kingdom. And so now, we see something happen and once again, this it got my attention again as I was reading through this and that who is it, how, how are the responses of sinful broken people different around Jesus than they would be around normal good religious leaders? The woman at the well, would she have been comfortable talking to a normal good religious leader in the way she was comfortable talking to Jesus? No. Um, the leper who came and knelt at Jesus' feet, would a leper feel comfortable kneeling at the feet of a good religious leader? No. Um, the sinners, the tax collectors who ended up eating with Jesus in Matthew's house, would they have felt doing the same thing with good religious leaders? No, but for some reason, instead of feeling like they needed to keep their distance from Jesus, which they would from a good religious leader, they felt like they wanted to be as close as possible to Jesus. Was there something different about the way that he affected their life? Didn't lead them into shame, he led them into hope. He led them into healing. And now we see the same thing happening with a man who has been severely demon-possessed. And it's interesting to me that when we look through religious eyes, through Western eyes, about what qualifies us to do ministry, that our model is more the, the academic model. So first you got to go to college, then you go to seminary, and then you take your psychological testing, and then you go, go through your committees, and then you do all these things. And when you're all done, then you get the approval to go so you can preach, and you can talk to people about Jesus. But I don't think that's the way that Jesus ran his ministry. Because who were the first missionaries that Jesus sent out? The woman at the well, who had had her scandalous background. The first thing she does is run into the village and say, Hey, come and see a guy who told me everything that I've ever done. She was the first missionary that I read, Jesus sending out. And now it gets even more scandalous than that. Who is the next missionary we're going to see sent out? A man who has been naked and breaking chains and eating cats and dogs out in the cemetery, demon-possessed. An hour earlier, he was completely demon-possessed. Now he's free. And what does Jesus say? You are the new president of the Jesus Christ Evangelistic Association <laughs> in the Decapolis. You go out and represent me. Would we even think about sending people out to be missionaries with that amount of training and experience? No, but that's the way the kingdom works. That it's not teaching people to be experts in religion, but it's simply saying, you know what, I used to be blind, now I can see. 
I used to eat cats and dogs naked in the cemetery. Now I'm in my right mind. I mean, there's something about, we, need, we make it way too difficult. Who is it that can go out and represent Jesus? Any one of us who have experienced his love and power in our lives. Our last reading is from John chapter 11, where Jesus' friend Lazarus dies. Jesus travels to Bethany, where Martha and Mary, Lazarus' sister, will lament that Jesus was too late to save their brother. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep, so the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus said again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha and the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Jesus will raise Lazarus, and many will believe in him. Okay, so a lot of these miraculous things that are happening are basically to connect those Old Testament prophecies of when the Messiah comes, these are the things that will happen. The blind will see, the, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, there will be miraculous provision of food from heaven. There will be miracles over nature. And what's the last thing to be defeated by the Messiah? Death. And so now we finally see, if you haven't figured out who Jesus is yet, it's now as he raises Lazarus from the dead. But it's interesting that as the kingdom of God comes, it's not just to display power to change lives, but part of the reason the kingdom is displayed in and through God's people is not just to share power, but to share God's heart to share God's character. So, what did they experience when Lazarus was raised from the dead? Just power? No, they experienced Jesus' tears. They experienced God's heart in the midst of what was going on. So as we demonstrate and we proclaim the kingdom, we're not just here so that powerful things can happen, we're here so that people can experience love. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 13, does the powerful stuff even make any difference unless it's displayed in love? So the, it's an interesting, we're moving now toward, in our church calendar, um, Palm Sunday in a couple of weeks. So next week in our readings, we're going to look at the death and resurrection of Jesus. We'll be a little bit ahead of time. But just to give you a little bit of perspective what's happening, that the kingdom is starting to draw all of these sinners and tax collectors and broken people to experience the love and power of God. But at the same time, it's alienating the religious people who think there's no way this guy could represent God because he doesn't fit in our box. But now something has happened that really puts things into a difficult situ situation for these religious leaders. After the resurrection of Lazarus, now all of a sudden they're thinking, this guy is way too popular. We don't even have a chance of getting at him because of what happened with Lazarus. So as he heads into Jerusalem, they're going to need to come up with a way to get him away from his crowds. Because they don't see him as a gift. They see him as a problem to get rid of. And so we're going to continue next week as we see what happens as he gets into Jerusalem. <clears throat>